Hello, Yes But Why listeners. This is your host, Amy Jordan. Welcome to episode 220 with improviser VJ Delos Reyes. But first, a bit about our sponsor. This episode of Yes But Why podcast is sponsored by Audible. You can get your free audiobook download and your 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why. Guys, I don't know about you, but I'm not getting out of the house as much as I used to. And with the tiny tyrant at home, I need a break. So I leave the kiddo at home with Chris and I take long drives. Just to get a breather, you know? And Audible is my new sidekick. I Bluetooth it in the car and then it just reads me stories and distracts me from the world. It's my new form of self-care. Let it be yours, too. Audible is available for your iPhone, Android, or Kindle. Download your free audiobook today at audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why. This week on Yes But Why, I talked to Canadian improviser and film actor VJ Delos Reyes. VJ is a positive and kind hearted soul. He was great to talk to. We talk about balancing family life with performing and teaching and having a day job. We talk about VJ's recent announcement to his improv community that he's decided to retire. Still, I don't think this is the last we're going to hear from VJ Delos Reyes. I now present to you, Yes But Why, episode 220. You ain't seen nothing yet from actor VJ Delos Reyes. Enjoy. I'm Amy Jordan, and this is Yes But Why podcast. Yeah. My first introduction to, I guess, the creative side or improv would have been back in high school. My first scene that I was in, it was uh, me and two friends of mine who eventually we end up forming a group together after high school. Um, for some, I don't, I really don't remember the details of it. It was about, I remember there was a pig involved and I played the pig for some strange reason. And I loved every single moment. The fact that they get to ride my back and I could be just this crazy war hog type pig. And to me, I thought that was being creative. <laughs> I thought that was being creative. And, uh, and then eventually it just led into more of what I liked about not just improv but acting itself like I could just be a complete idiot and have fun with it and show you know emotions and different type of emotions and you know uh, but then when I got to my professional career wait uh, hold on wait scene, you acted as a well, pig I need to know I need to know more about this pig <laughs> you were a pig did you guys pig. write a scene and like, and you like no, wrote a no. play, was, and so you were like, "Here's a pig," and you were like, "I'll play the pig." It was, it was <laughs> an exercise where we had to, if I remember really, I remember it was I think it was grade nine, where my teacher was introducing us how to uh, emulate characters of uh, animal animal like uh, traits. So you're still human, but you have the character traits of a pig or uh, a giraffe. Right. And so and that would help us get into a character. But I don't think I I don't think I read it right or whatever. And it was all improvised, too. So I went out there as a pig and started talking like I was a pig. But then afterwards, my my teacher was like, you do know the exercise was about human human characters, human actors playing characteristics of an animal. You chose a pig and you became a pig no <laughs> and i was like okay and so it just no and that and that it's, it's still stuck with me it's still stuck with me and i was like okay that's not what i'm going with but eventually we did it again and we did a few more improv scenes and eventually become like uh part of a play i don't know what the play was called but it was part of a play that i never actually played the character of the pig again but somehow that character i guess inspired my director to write something based on the fault of a of an actor not doing things properly <laughs> it was weird it was like weird but then i just started learning how to become like getting familiar with my body more 
was weird. It was like a weird grade nine moment in my life. Can you imagine for a second this teacher? Like, they're like, yeah, listen, whatever you want to do in that theater class is fine. If you want to, like, do improv exercises to make a play, (laughs) that would totally be cool. She's like, great, awesome. I'm going to do this now. I'm writing Lord of the Flies, (laughs) but it's instead it's going to be created by weird improv exercises (laughs) that, like, 14-year-olds are doing for me. Like, what? (laughs) And that was the thing too. My my drama teacher was remarkable. Like his name is Michael Reed, and he was uh, such a great facilitator to my whole acting time in high school. He introduced me to improv, and uh, and he told me about companies out uh, out in Vancouver that do things like this. And I was like, okay. And so we did a school field trip, which was weird. It was like at night at like seven thirty, eight o'clock on a Wednesday night, and we're going on a school field trip to watch improv and. And I was, I was just, I was hooked from there. And then I realized, oh man, you could do almost anything in the world of improv. And uh, so I sort of balanced a little bit both. But the the pig thing was something that really <laughs> scarred me for a long. Yeah. It brought bad memories. <laughs> also, the so, person who was, told you no was not Michael Reed, right? This was a like female no. teacher previous. No, it was uh, it was like a, a student aide. And uh, oh. because I think the student A was graduating, he had he felt like he had this sort of like um, hierarchy to lower lower grade students, and he wasn't mean about it. If I don't if I remember, he wasn't mean about it. He was just being like, "Oh no, that's not how it's supposed to go." Like he was sort of he was supportive, but also like a little belittling. But it was kind of funny at the same time. Like he was like, "I loved it, but no, that's not how it's supposed to go." <laughs> oh man. I hate that, man. No, no. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was like, oh, I thought I was doing good. <laughs> yeah, right? You so. were. You were doing great. doesn't matter what you did. You did something, and that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, man. People then, with high hopes of high school theater. They're ridiculous. <laughs> Especially in grade nine, where right? your hopes are, where your dreams, you didn't care. You were just being ridiculous and trying to be funny for your friends. And trying I was doing this. I was... I was trying to be approved. I was trying to get approval from my classmates and they liked it. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, I think that revolutionized of how I was going to start doing shows uh, based on that, on the audience reaction. Really. I was like, I'm going to perform for myself because this is fun. Yeah. <laughs> so you said you started a group with your friends. Did you guys start doing improv on your own time outside of the theater classes you had with uh, Mr. Reed? Uh, well, so what had happened was in my grade 12 year, um, I was not really part of an improv troupe until after high school. And, but what had happened, I had a group of friends, probably five of them who were probably a year or two older than me. They had an improv troupe with, uh, called and get this, their name was 43 pounds of wasted space. Uh, that was the name of their improv troupe. I, <laughs> And uh, so me and two of my friends, uh, we were in grade 12, and there was a TV show, a local TV show here in Vancouver called Sportscast, and it was basically like high school uh, high school drama teams, primarily improv, would battle each other out for, you know, improv supremacy or whatever in Vancouver. And uh, I was on the, the winning team that won the whole thing. And because the five friends who were older than us, uh, they were going to go on a Europe trip, but they had a manager at the time too. But they were like, we can't, you guys can't lose this momentum. So you guys need to find replacements for you guys. So when you guys come back, the, the comp, the, the troop will still be going. And so they asked us to join. uh, And I think uh, probably one or other person, I can't remember, but they asked us to join. And so we did, random shows um shows for like uh, like uh, summer camps for uh, handicapped uh, students and and it was great it was fantastic and it was something that because then by then i was graduating i already graduated from high school and i was like okay this is what i'm doing for a bit even though i have a day job yeah. i'll do this on the side too and so we got to do so many shows and then the one big moment was meeting like uh, a canadian hockey legend gordy howe doing an improv show in Ooh. front of him. I don't know how hammered he was, but he seemed to enjoy it. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, and then eventually when those five gentlemen 
five gentlemen came back from their trip from Europe, uh, they heard so many great things from the manager that they said, well, why don't you guys join us? And so we ended up becoming a, t a group of eight and then another person joined in a year after us. And so we were like, and we were like all, all male troop. And, uh, I was the only, uh, person of color, but it never really mattered to me. Cause I was like, Oh, you guys accept me for doing my skill stuff and whatever. So, and we did shows left and right, uh, for like New Year's Eve shows, uh, in Vancouver. And, you know, it was sort of like, it was kind of cool because we were sort of, we felt like rock stars in a way, given though it was improv and we just went all over, like, I think in one year we did probably like 150 shows and wow. for people who just, for people who did uh, just graduated from high school, man, you can't, you can't get that. That was, it was an, it was awesome. Like doing shows in front of people who didn't even know us. And, uh, we used to do shows in front of friends, but then that blew up blossom into a bigger venue for us and doing shows in like a weekly thing at a local theater. Um, and it just became like so much fun that we inspired another group of, uh, high school students that was within our uh, living proximities um, in Vancouver that they formed their own troupe called the backward zone. And so in the North, in the, in the North Vancouver area, which is a, a district in uh, Vancouver, uh, it was two, two improv companies that, well, not companies, two improv troops uh, performing on the same area. And then we had Vancouver theater sports league that was doing their own thing. Obviously we all, both groups all fell in love with Vancouver Theater Sports League and what they brought to improv and how it inspired us. And uh, yeah, and and then unfortunately it started tapering down uh, for for all of us. Uh, some of us got married, some of us wanted to do other things, and uh, I I was the only one that really kept on going with it. And that was like, man, I think about it now. I think that was like ninety six, ninety seven when when we officially sort of shut down that uh, that troop, and I was the only one that could kept on going with another troupe that I helped form. Uh, to this day, we're actually still friends with all with my second group too. So did you, how great. many years did you do, um, 43 pounds? Uh, so I graduated in 92. I think we did it for, I want to say five years, five years. And then at that time, near the tail end of that time, I thought, you know what, maybe I could help, other students form their own improv troupe and I could be sort of their manager and whatnot. And so I started going around the high schools and whatever, and just like sort of like scouting. <laughs> I was like a scout, but it, it was kind of weird because I was like talking to students and then they would have to talk to their parents and they would ask me questions. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to go to the school that I know, which is my old high school and ask students there because they know me. So, uh, and then we just formed the group and we held auditions and that group ended up being that, and that group that I ended up forming myself was, uh, they were known as the right side prodigy. And then that company, that troop sort of fizzled out after a year or two. And, and then at the same time, the backwards zone, the other troop in North Vancouver started phasing out. But then me and a friend of mine collaborated together. It's like, why don't we both collaborate together with forming a troop, like an, a comedy troupe that does sketch comedy and improv and everything else. And we could have some musical entanglement in there too. And so we ended up forming a, a company called Sketch, which was, <laughs> um, which was an improv slash sketch comedy group. And, uh, you know, that company phased out after five, seven years of performing with each other, but we're still to this day, still close friends. We all, whenever we all meet up, we still laugh at those times. And we, I'm actually still really good friends with one of them too. So was that just a troop and you went to different venues or did you have a brick and mortar as well? Uh, we went to different venues. Like, uh, mm -hmm. we just, we went, we went as far to the point where <clears throat> one of our, one of our gentlemen, one of our guys, he had a contact with an animator who was doing, who was writing shows for kids shows for a show in, for India and Singapore. And so that guy, the writer knew of us and was like, Hey, why don't you guys come on down and start uh, laying down voice work for us. And so we were thrilled. And then obviously we brought more people in to help us out, but it was like, 
I guess we did a lot of shows. Um, and then we did a lot of shows with that group. And then at the same time, I was part of another group, which was two, three Filipino guys. We were known as FOB, no, uh, fresh off the boat. <laughs> and we started doing improv musical uh, sketch comedy competitions, just us three, while the sketch group started phasing out, which was like, again, like a five, maybe six year term of running with those guys that uh, the FOB started picking up a lot, a lot more steam. We won, me and two of my buddies, we ended up winning like uh, two back to back to back uh, sketch comedy competitions um, because I was with theater sports at that point then. Another gentleman was also with theater sports, so we had this comedy background um, fix that we were ever, we never really went anywhere with it though. That was the only thing we couldn't com- we couldn't complete what we wanted to do, and that was to go back to the Philippines and showcase uh, Canadian Filipinos doing improv in front of our homeland people. Um, I think that was the one regret that we couldn't do because one of us got married. One of us was started doing their own show, and I was doing shows with theater sports. So it was, it was sort of all became um, a disheartening dream. But I think somewhere down the road we'll still do it. But we're all busy right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you guys, you're still friends with those guys, you know? Because it's not like gone forever. You could still plausibly. No, do it. no. Like I'm, I, I, in fact, actually, one of the guys, his name is Chris Casillan. He's with theater sports as well as I am. And so him and I, we'll st- we still see each other. And this other gentleman, Dave Demapolis, uh, him and I still keep in close contact. So we're still all in close contact. I, we haven't done a show uh, for like almost, like as three of us, almost for like four years as a troupe um, because we've all gotten lives all of a sudden. Like uh, my friend Dave had got married and had two kids. Uh, myself, I got married. I have a single kid. And Chris Casillan is constantly touring the world under the blanket of this company uh this this comedy group called the comic strippers uh where it's like five or six guys dress up as chippendales all they're all known as chip and they're all doing <laughs> they're doing improv scenes and somehow music 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 kicks in and they start playing to the audience which predominantly are all women <laughs> and they start you know becoming like really like chippendale dancers and then they when the music stops they go back into the scene again so oh he's been God. doing that for, uh, yeah. yeah yeah and uh they've had Man. they've traveled all over the world it's that great. is like, how uh, you sell improv uh, oh <laughs> that is how you do it good oh, yeah. lord they, so oh they've gone God. they've gone places and I, I give them all props to them because so like funny. and not to take any away from them the good on them for no, them, it's but awesome their their bodies are not the greatest Who to look cares? At. So, so when they when they do shows they're always wearing just a purple bow tie and purple spandex i love it shirtless that's the best and uh and so i hope they they're also fat and hairy fe- that's what i hope that's all i want oh. <laughs> and they also added a female who obviously is not going to be naked. They, they, she covers herself up and she calls herself chip as well too. She's got a fake mustache, fake, um, to pay. And she does the same thing, but without, with the shirt on. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's what, uh, I mean, I, again, oh I'm still God, in close contact with all those hilarious. people. Yeah. You know, so I, I wanted to ask you a lot of the stuff that you've mentioned is a lot of what, people refer to as like indie troops like not troops associated yeah. with a particular theater or a group or a community but like you created uh-huh. a lot of stuff on your own like how did you how did you like know was it because of the troop that you were in with the manager and stuff that you like sort of knew the framework of what you needed to build to do these shows because like I didn't know what to do until I got taught by somebody you know what i mean like but you're creating stuff out of nothing how's that i think because so my first group was 43 pounds there was nine guys or eight to nine guys and me because i was so fresh and new into the world of doing improv i guess professionally um was i didn't really say much because i needed to know i'm doing this right and everyone else the the guys who who formed it before i did Honestly, obviously had a lot of say. And so there was one gentleman, he really took the reins on 
what the what their next show would be or an idea and we all followed suit and so i would sort of be attached to the hip on him because i wanted to see like what promotional ideas he had and how to get us all involved into really selling our shows and um he did a lot of legwork <laughs> he was more the contact from from us to our manager and vice versa so he was a he was a the hub and so um but for booking venues and whatnot i had to learn the hard way like i would have to say hey can we do a show uh you guys could take the full profits <laughs> and then and at the end of the night we'd be like oh so we got nothing out of that show okay well thank you for the venue it was type of that like those type of things and i, I didn't i to this day i still have a tough time trying to bargain if, if, this, if uh, there was a venue opening like how to how to get some profit out of that to benefit us but it was it was trial and error like i think i i think we did about 15 shows completely free under my guidance (laughs) and and none of the players were asking for it they weren't asking for money they just they were just happy happy to do shows that uh that they wanted to do even after high school dude that's awesome i love that you like you know figured it out and and that you're, you know, propelling forward what you wanted to make, you know, that it's just really mm-hmm. like not a lot of people do that. You know, I, I've definitely, I've definitely encountered a lot of people who need somebody else to take them along the way. So it's really awesome that, you know, you're, you, you met people that like taught you cool and interesting things. And then it like just propelled you forward to make it happen. Even the, even yeah. when you said that you helped that other group, like not everybody is trying to like make other people famous or like help them. Right. You could have been like, yeah. I'm the best. Let me go show you how I'm great. Instead. You're like, let me help other people have a great experience. Like I did. Like that's admirable. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, it's funny, too, because I think within that time of 43 pounds uh, sort of phasing out, right side prodigy sort of phasing out, and then sketch, and this, uh, I think, F, uh, fresh off the boat sort of came later on. But between that time, <clears throat> my friend who uh, him and I had talked about forming a group together, he wanted to put on a high school improv tournament uh, because he remembered me doing shows uh, for this, again, this TV show called Sportscast. So he wanted to sort of bring something back like that for local high school students to do improv and whatnot. So um, it gave me the opportunity to go into the schools doing improv workshops and whatnot. That that actually became so rewarding for me that uh, there was one school, I remember there's a, there's a national competition here in Canada called the Canadian Improv Games. And what it is is that it's basically like schools all across Canada. Uh, a, a team of eight students would form, would do scenes, do improv scenes based on certain themes or story arcs or whatever. And they would get scored. And uh, the top team in each province uh, would represent that province and then fly over to the capital, which is Ottawa. And then they would battle out each other. And then if you won, you were the top, top improv team in Canada. And so what had happened, I actually felt sorry for this one school that I ended up becoming their coach um, for, wow, I think that was 1999, 98, 99, where I started coaching this one team. And they always finished dead last in the competition. And the one year I asked two of my friends to help me coach them because I didn't know anything about the Canadian Improv Games uh, format. They helped me. And from dead last the year before they finished first place and yeah. that got me more that got me more interested uh into possibly coaching and that was where really the coaching bug sort of took off for me like i started coaching the same school and they became not that that, that not that they were disrespected or didn't look at it, it was like for me it was like i want to help these kids know that improv is fun And um, whenever these guys were doing improv before I showed up, they were sort of disheartened and they they could see, you could see in their eyes that they wanted to be like the other teams who were just as, just so good and whatnot. So I thought I'd sort of give them back, but that became 
<clears throat> that became a 10 year journey <laughs> of me coaching one school, leaving that school, going to another school and then going back to the same school. It was 10 years of doing that. And by 2010, I, I sort of stopped, uh, um, the biggest reward out of all that was in 2010, uh, one of the parents asked me if I could organize a group of students that I have had access or had coached or whatever, and if they could be part of the, the 2010 Olympics. And so I had them, I had students roaming or roving around as alien ski board uh, kids uh, while delegates from like Ukraine, Japan, Jamaica coming on down. Our, our booth was right next to uh, the top athletes of their particular sport. It was so surreal. So when the Olympics happened, we, we relished it. And that was, that was probably when I last coached a improv team. Did they perform the in the Olympics? Well, they, they did roving. They didn't really perform, so they rolled Not like around. on a stage, so would... but like they did character work at the convention? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, they would walk around. They would walk around. And obviously, I had to sort of retrain them sure. because at that point, it was – it was they at that time they were just done with improv <laughs> because it, it was like six months. Like when I was coaching teams, I would coach for like probably four or five months, uh, and, and it was like three rehearsals every week for like four hours, just getting ready for a competition. And uh, and by the time their competition season was over, they were just mentally drained, and that was the last thing they wanted to do was do more improv, and so. Um, really, I told them, I was like, if you, you guys have a choice. You don't have to do it, but think about it. It's the Olympics. How often do you get to do that and like wear a colored spandex over your face and body and just roam around like you're this alien, um, alien character and just taking pictures with them and whatever? And I was like, you guys, let's do it. Why not? <laughs> and they Dude, loved so it. Awesome. And I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. And we, we met so many. Uh, athletes. Uh, one of them, one of my uh, one of my students at the time, sat next to a lady who eventually later on, I think in that week, won the gold medal for ski boarding. <laughs> like it was that's it was so surreal. And she's from Canada too. I'm being, from, from Vancouver, and so it was like we were rubbing shoulders with athletes that obviously we never really paid attention to the sport, but yet here we are, and it was it was a great time. But that was my whole that was my whole improv thing. Like I it was yeah. all about coaching and teaching yeah and... teaching you're really such a teacher i feel like you're like your vibe of teaching has been there since the beginning though you've been like supportive and getting helping people trying to help them get organized i mean that's pretty great yeah. I mean, did you always want to be a teacher or no no i think because my drama teacher did a had a huge impression on me because he loved the craft of drama like the art of acting he taught us to respect it like he told us he taught he told us and taught us that um you could do what you want to do but you have to respect that stage um and i will help you with that and if you go all out of line or if you happen to say you know the mac b word the shakespearean mac b word i will tell you <laughs> and i don't have to explain it to you because you know that it's kind of bad and so it was stuff like that. I had a great mentor, my drama teacher, who taught us. And the funny thing is, actually, my first group, uh, my first group, uh, 43 Pounds of Waste Space, we all graduated from the same high school. Uh, we were probably a year or two apart from each other, but we were all taught by the same teacher. And that's where we all knew each other and got comfortable knowing each other. And that was all. And our drama teacher was actually the first one to set up the first gig for those five. Like he set up the first outside gig for the the first five guys that started the started the improv troupe. So he had, he left a big impression of how to really respect the stage and respect the theater. And you know, like um, most most schools nowadays don't have the proper drama atmosphere, and so they'll treat it with such disrespect. And I I take that to heart. And so uh, I, not that I would crease into these students because I was I went into these schools as a volunteer coach. I could have easily just picked up and left and not come back. But I, it meant so much to me to have these kids succeed and have them appreciate what I truly love and uh, what I really love giving back to these kids. And they actually, I would even when the improv season was done at their local high schools, 
I would actually do it like probably once, maybe twice a week until the end of the school year of doing lunch hour shows. I would actually have like uh, like a website build and say, hey, you know what? Go on to this website and you'll see who's cast for the show for the new hour. New hour. And I was, I sort of tried trade treated it like it was like a professional company that was what's so weird <laughs> it's like i'm living the life of theater sports and i'm actually replicating that at, at grand uh at the local high school i actually bought like a website and and the domain name so students of their high school could actually look it up it's like oh so and so's playing okay i'll come see the lunch hour show it's pretty neat that and i went awesome. on pretty strong for like four for four years i went on pretty strong doing that and then i just got tired <laughs> sure. just got tired doing it volunteering sure and not also like super hard to be doing um when you're you know not really getting as much from it though though you know i'm sure you're getting plenty of like you know soul work out of it really great the work that you're doing the uh for those kids i mean and and thank goodness for mr reed for inspiring you because like you know you were there for those kids. They needed a theater person to show them that it was yeah. cool and how to like do the business part. You know, think of all of them yeah. that learned from you that probably right now are like putting on their own shows because you showed them how to do it. Like that's really great. Yeah. I think what's fascinating too, cause I've uh, obviously my time with theater sports, I haven't really seen those students and they graduated back in 2014, maybe even earlier than that. And, there was probably maybe a couple of years ago, one of them, maybe two of them came back to do training at theater sports. And I was like, what? It's like, yeah, I sort of missed this. We want to get back into it again. But she, they never continued on. But the fact that they had thought about doing it again, I was like, oh, that meant a lot. I was like, well, that's great. Maybe we could, maybe eventually you could probably move up and you and I could do start doing shows professionally. But <clears throat> alas, they yeah. didn't do it. They, they didn't continue it. But the fact that they, they really love doing they loved it and uh i was rewarded with uh with a lot of good friendships uh and out of that because eventually they became my friends and i'd have them on facebook so in time at times i keep checking what they're doing and how they're all doing and whatnot so yeah it was something for me is like i i always wanted to give something back because my teacher gave me something that i always loved and and um sketch comedy was one part that was one half of what I really loved. And I rarely wrote sketch comedy. <laughs> and so I thought I'd try it with uh, my, my friends that called sketch and, you know, and not to say we were successful in it, but it gave me a sense of like, okay, so we do improv and let's see if we can try to replicate that onto page onto paper and start writing. And uh, I think we were okay with that. Uh, we didn't do a lot of writing courses. We didn't, one of my closest friends was like an amazing writer. He used to write grants for a lot of things. So he was, and he was also in the arts and writing scripts for for plays and whatnot. So I tapped into his sort of knowledge and asked, asked him for his help and see how we get into sketch comedy stuff. And, you know, uh, but more so my background was always, always been improv. And I've always done that. And then it helped me doing like a lot of film and TV stuff too. Hmm. So when you said you were working in the with the high schools for about 10 years oh. until 2010. Now, during the time that you're working with the high schools, are you you also mentioned there was an overlap with Vancouver Theater Sports. Did you like go over there and start working with them and you were doing your own stuff and working uh, within the institution or how did that yeah. work for you in your path? So what had happened, so between that overlap, uh, before 2010, I had a day job. I was selling shoes. And nice. then the odd time was for part-time. So on the side, I would actually, if I wasn't working at my day job, um, I would be at the school teaching. And then if I wasn't teaching, if I had to work the next day, I would be working the next day. But when where theater sports really came into play for me was 2007. But prior to that, I was still in my training process of theater sports. So my schedule to them for theater sports was only on Saturday afternoons doing training, workshops, whatever. So I balanced it out. But then come 20, 2007, um, early 2007, that's when it became uh, a little bit of a balancing juggling act because then I had my day job. I had to. I was so committed to coaching these teams. But then at night I had to do shows at theater sports. 
And so it would be, <laughs> it would be if I accumulate the volunteer hours with the high schools and shows, I think on average, I was thinking about doing, I think, yeah, I think I was doing on average about 50 hours a week of like Whoa. both my day job, my day job, theater sports shows, uh, coaching and all that and then rinse and repeat over and over again every week. Honestly, I think you're lowballing. I I legitimately think it's (laughs) way more than that. 50 hours? There's no way that you're only putting 10 hours a week into your high school coaching and your shows and whatnot at Vancouver Vancouver Theater Sports. There's no way. And that was was also... (laughs) And also, that that was the year, actually. 2007 was the year... So this is where it really rewarded me with uh, the coaching. So we did a night show at the local high school for these kids to final off, to finish off their year. And I, I, I produced a show for these kids to say thank you for the crowd, thank you to the audience for supporting them during this whole improv season. And in there, uh, one of the mothers of one of the kids I was working with came up to me. He's like, hey, listen, um, I want to – Someone wants to meet you right now. Do you have time? And I was a casting director for a TV show. Whoa. And I was like, sure. So I talked to her. And I was like, hey, listen, do you have an agent? I'm like, no, I don't, actually. I haven't even thought about having an agent for almost 10, 15 years. It was never on my mind. It's like, okay, how about this? Don't worry about that. I want you to read for me uh, like in three days for a TV show called – this Canadian show called Intelligence. It's, it's an audition. I'm like, um, sure. <laughs> um, okay. And so three days later, I go to this, I go into the, this elevator and I go up to this, go into this casting room. And, uh, but before that, I was in this elevator with this gentleman who's like this scraggly old guy, white pointy beard, bald, and he just looked like he shouldn't be there. <laughs> and I get out and he's getting up on the same floor with me. And I all of a sudden I look around and then, now, take in mind, Amy, like it's been almost maybe 10 years since I last auditioned. Now, maybe when I was still in high school when I was auditioning. And I haven't auditioned at that point for quite some time. So it was kind of surreal going back into an auditioning scenario where I see all these other people who sort of look like me. And I was like, oh, oh weird. Okay. And so I went in there. And lo and behold, the gentleman that was with me in the elevator was the creator of the show <laughs> and, and uh, of the creator of the sh- and the creator of the show was a huge advocate of people of color, especially on his Canadian show so right. not that I not that I thought about that as a, a reason that I would probably get cast or whatever I was like this is, this is crazy I'm actually auditioning and um, and I eventually got a hold. Uh, so the next day I got a call from this gentleman who happened to be my agent then or now at that point. And it's like, Hey, let's talk. And so we were talking and while we were talking, he gets a call from the casting director. He's like, Hey, that guy, so-and-so, uh, can you tell me he booked the role? I'm like, uh, sure. So he, we, during the interview with this casting director or this, uh, agent is like, Hey, so, Congratulations, you booked the role. Do you want to do you want me to sign you now? <laughs> and that's how how it all happened. Like I got a I got a casting director who saw me host a high school improv show um and then it led me to doing an audition and booking my first ever TV role. It was a very small role for that, but it was like uh, I didn't know what I was doing. And uh Dude, awesome. and then later Yeah, and then later on that year Probably a month later, uh, the executive director of theater sports called me into his office. He's like, hey, listen, uh, I know you're done with your two-year training. We want to move you up to main stage. And so I was just like, everything was happening all at once. Like, all of a sudden, I got a booking a role on a TV show for a Canadian, local, a Canadian TV show. All of a sudden, I'm getting moved up from my training to uh, main stage roster of theater sports. And it was just like, oof, what's going on? And then that summer became even more of a whirlwind where I was booking TV shows left and right while doing, while working my day job. And and, and then like school by then was already was their summer season. So I had no coaching, but then I was like, had my day job, theater sports, doing 
doing the acting on film and TV, I was like, whoa, this is crazy. And, uh, and then the following year was the big one for me, and it's still paying off for me, was booking my first movie, uh, my first nice. feature movie. And uh, it was kind of surreal seeing like the guy who directed Macaulay Culkin and all the Harry Potter movies. He was the one directing me. I'm like, why am I doing this? How is this possible? And I think I was just in the right place in the right time. What was the movie? Uh, Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. I played a oh one of five. Jan- I was played one of five janitors who turned into a five-headed dragon or a hydra. Yeah, and you did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was great. It was a great experience, and you know, I I was on set for nine days, and during that time, I I met probably some of the coolest guys who were my co-stars. Uh, that one of to this day, actually two of them, I still keep in close contact. Uh, but yeah, it was one of these things where um, I'm I'm sitting there in my trailer having a smoke. All of a sudden, Pierce Brosnan walks by. Uma Thurman's walking right behind him. I'm like, what is going on? In the span of a year, things just turned around for the better for me. It was great, but I, I honestly had to pinch myself because then when. When school went back in again, I went back into my old routine, day job, coaching, the odd time doing a theater sports show. But that was, I, I fell in love with film and TV even more so. And then I kept on pushing for it. And then uh, then it just sort of faded out of me. I sort of lost the love of film and TV and I wanted to do something else and whatnot. Were you like doing stuff and then it kind of like fizzled away like there wasn't as much going on or did you do like a role and it just left a bad taste in your mouth and you don't have to give details? Um, oh, gosh, like, no, you know. no. Yeah, no, I, I was doing roles. Uh, I was booking small roles and I think it was because at that time I had a day job and then the fact that I had an audition during a day at times, that would take me away from part of my work and then do this audition and go back to work. So it was the prep. It was my own preparation mm. that of yeah. reading sides. I was, I guess I was more committed to my day job uh, that I couldn't really put in the time and effort the night before for my sides uh, when it came to auditioning. Cause when I, whenever, when I went to the audition room after, um, you know, after doing a part of my job, my day job, I was stressed out. I was, I was like kind of stressing out because I didn't know my lines or I may forget it. And then I was walking there with like sweating buckets, but it was because I was running from one place to another and uh, whatnot. But I mean, the last, I mean, my, my all time favorite role that I ever did was playing a janitor. Like I had to say it, but it was playing a janitor. Like I played two, I was typecast in a way because I played a janitor in the movie, but then I did a, I was a janitor in a TV show called the killing. And that role was oh. kind of an eerie, it was an eerie character. I was like, uh, I was a janitor, pedophile janitor. It was creepy. And I, I had like a that small show. role. Ooh, now I'm going to rewatch it yeah. just to watch you. Yeah, it's, it's episode three, season one called El Diablo, if you guys are oh. interested. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was one of those roles that, uh, that really took me to a very dark place in regards to preparation. And I, yeah. to this day, I still feel dirty and creepy about it. But the whole idea, uh, where the casting director was getting me at was to get into the most darkest and ugliest place. It's like, no, I can't do this. Um, I'll just pretend. I'll just pretend. And uh, sure enough, I mean, I booked the role, but it was the way I got it was kind of creepy. I didn't like it. Yeah, I hear <laughs> but it was one of my, it was one of my favorite roles. Don't get me wrong, but it was like it was kind of creepy of how I got it. I didn't like that feeling. Mm. So I, I guess and I guess from there it was like maybe I probably booked more, probably two, three more shows and whatever. And then uh, my wife and I at that point we we just got engaged, and the following year we were going to get married. And so it was a lot of preparation for that, and then. At the same that same year we got married, later on that year, 2017, my daughter was born. So we had a lot of things that, to me, I had to put on the, on the back end for now, and focus on the wedding and then and stuff. But at the same time, I still maintain a day job as well as theater sports. Yeah, I mean, so. it's hard, and I totally feel you were in the same position of like. <laughs> 
I want to be super creative and I want to do all these things. But like right now in the world, I uh, like my mission right now is to take care of this kid. Like that's what I'm doing. I've been doing theater for a long time. I feel the same way about like, you know, once I got, once we prepared to get married and then we, you know, my husband and I were married for five years before we had kids. Cause like I said, we were like, wait, what? Oh, we're having kids. (laughs) Um, But, um, but at the same time, like one, now that he's here, like it's, you know, I keep thinking about people like, Oh, are you, you know, you're not around the theater as much. Is it like a problem? And I'm like, no, it's just, this is my life now. Like I'm hanging out with him. He's a great dude. Like I want to be with my, my boy for as long as I can. And he'll go to school soon you know eventually a year or so and then then i can do whatever you know then i can be doing different things and figuring stuff out he's got an activity i'll have an activity but for right now yeah and and you know and that was the thing too like uh and it was hard too because i was living with we were living with my in-laws for a bit there too while Mm -hmm. my little girl was born so uh, obviously doing like late hours with theater sports and um having a day job it took me away and I felt like I couldn't do much and help. And so my in-laws would be, my in-laws would be there to help. But thankfully I was, they were there, but, uh, it, there was, there was a lot of guilt on my side. Like, man, I, I gotta be there more often. I gotta be at home to help with, with the baby and whatnot, because obviously post mortem is, it was a real thing. And I was so, mm-hmm. I felt so guilty that eventually like, you know, during the shutdown and the lockdown of, recently uh, it gave me a moment of pause i'm like oh great i get to hang out with my kid my wife could still do some work and i'm gonna love every moment of this because i felt like i lost a lot that uh you know this is gonna be news to you amy uh but yesterday i actually retired from theater sports and the improv community yesterday because um it was just too it was just too much for me to lose and i wanted to be with my family more so and so you caught me mm. on uh, the the morning of my uh, my time doing improv because I was there for 14 years and I have nothing but great memories and great people. Um, you know, it was it was so much fun. But uh, time was at an essence for me with my kid, and I was like, you know what, I want to be with my family now. And maybe this uh, this pandemic probably was a benefit to me because it gave me the opportunity to be with my family. So. Yeah. yeah. So you got news. I mean, today, you got uh, right. Uh, this is one of those news podcasts. I'm revealing <laughs> amazing news, and I mean that's an important part of your journey for sure. You know, yeah. and I, I mean, I feel you. I haven't. I was after I had the baby. I didn't do anything at the theater for two years. Um, it was yeah. only two years after that I even kind of felt like I could come back. Um, yeah. but like, but I mean, the way that it works yeah. for you though, I mean, you say you retire, but like plausibly in five years, if you want to go do stuff, you can go back. Right. Or is it like a, you had an earned spot in a group and now you're leaving that group. So like somebody else will fill in and you need to come back <laughs> no, in, in a different way. I don't know how that institution I'm, I'm, ever I'm works. Turning you know? 46, yeah. I'm turning 46 this year mm-hmm. and, uh, I mean, I feel like I do have a little bit left, but really uh, it's, I mean, I've done a lot of shows for theater sports in the past and they gave me so much opportunity learning the craft of improv. I mean, the highlights of my moment with theater sports is sharing the stage as a host uh, for Colin Mockery, like this Canadian legend and whose line is an anyway star. And I did it twice in my lifetime. And uh, also the best part with theater sports, I wasn't just a performer. I was also a tech improviser too. So I would do sound. I would do lighting for shows. Oh, so nice. I was the most versatile. I was the most versatile player in the company because I could be either on stage, uh, but if uh, a technician was sick, I could hop up in the booth, and uh, and someone else would fill in my spot on stage for that night. So I was pretty versatile in that. And then also I was doing local shows as well too for friends of mine who had their own little small groups called the fictionals and then another group would you know would do shows called the radicals and so i would i would space myself out to the point where you know i think i've i i i was doing too much 
I felt like I was doing too much to the point where I needed, I needed, to, I needed a, maybe a couple. Well, yeah, I was doing too much, especially with a newborn and, uh, you yeah. know, it was taking me, I, I felt a lot of, there was so much guilt still, uh, that ultimately I was, I was content. I was doing so much with like what I did theater sports and the other improv companies I've uh, had the pleasure of working with in the last few years or so that, uh, I mean, I, we recently had an improv conference, uh, with international, uh, improv theater sports conference at our theater. And it was sort of like, uh, the Olympics or sort of like uh, the UN coming to our theater. And you could see all these performers doing their, they're doing their take on what improv is like. And Dan O'Connor from LA doing his, his genre piece. And it was like, so amazing work, such amazing work that, uh, I happened to tech one of, uh, Dan O'Connor uh, improviser in, in, LA he came up and he directed like local actor local improvisers from our company and other people like Patty Styles and whatnot and at the end of it Amy I had never seen it ever in my life but they got a standing ovation it was so I was so happy to be witnessing that and the fact that I teched that it gave me such a high I was like I came up I went up to my my colleagues who I do shows with after it's like, guys, that was, I bow to you guys because you guys got that. And I, I, I support that because that was amazing. And then I went to Dan and I was like, man, it's, it was, it was such a great feeling seeing another variation of what improv could be. And, uh, and it was, it was, it was challenging times up in Vancouver trying to learn new things or try to bring new things because here what's always about comedy. It's always about, you know, theater sports, and it's all about the fast-paced, quick wit stuff. And uh, mm. what Dan brought to uh, introduce me was slow pace improv, doing dramatic style, complete one-act play, no laugh. Yeah, you'll get the laughs, but being honest and true and whatnot, and it left a huge impression on me. That to me, I eventually started bringing that to myself on stage, bring the realism, bringing you know the idea of what true emotions could be i actually am i think i did a scene one time where it was supposed to be like you know robbing a bank and i stood there being held up and i actually started crying on stage like I, as if i was the person being held up and one of my advisors colleagues came up to me afterwards like are you okay i'm like yeah why it's like um i didn't know how to react to that because you actually started crying on stage like oh no that's my character i was just like i didn't want to be shot that was what i was thinking in my head I didn't want to get shot because I have a family to worry about. And then all of a sudden, it was like all this realism in my head started popping in. I'm like, okay, this is too real to me. <laughs> Not that I ever got held up ever in my life, but the fact, the idea that sort of came yeah. in and my true emotions, I was like, and that came from Dan O'Connor. Like, it was just like eerily, it was, it was awesome. It was such a great feeling. And so that whole conference itself was such a great exposure to what improv could be and uh, what it should be and that's just community and love for each other it was it was great i loved it a lot dude you gotta go to europe and asia now okay i know that you just said that you weren't going to do improv <laughs> anymore but so they won't do that improv <laughs> europe and asia is all about the dramatic stuff they think the, dra- the they genre they think the comedy stuff is gauche like i've talked to people and they're yeah. like oh yeah we know you guys do the comedy stuff sure yeah and it's like you what know- is it not cool we're not cool and I, I i always accept that as an american i'm not cool and i'm fine with that you know but, but you know, so I, many people I, you love it oh my god um, yeah you know it's funny i've i've met a couple of people from uh, Austin, uh, who came up here for our improv tournament, Roy, and I think Casey Beeler. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're a company, uh, that's, uh, that does genre pieces, genre piece type improv. And that's something that was introduced to me earlier last, late last year. I was like, Oh, I never knew anything about that. And then we had a company come out from Hawaii, um, and, and Garrick and whatnot. They did introduced us to, uh, what they do quite often was a lot of genre pieces. And one of them was uh, Kabuki, Kabuki improv. Oh. And it was like a Herald style, but Kabuki, honest Kabuki characters, not mocking it or whatever. It was like oh. true to form. And then I went on their website and they're all about the genre, 
genre pieces of improv, like doing a Harry Potter version, but with doing with true, honest Harry Potter. They actually, I think they got like dialect coaches to help them with their British accent. So they're not, uh, uh, be smirching it. It was like, wow, you guys went all out on that. Like that's crazy. And I, and then the bonus is, is that because they're tapping into something like Harry Potter or whatever, they get hired to do roving characters uh, for fan act, like cosplay shows, right? And so that was a, like oh, that's a yeah. side job, that's a side job from what they already do already. So that was like oh yeah, the bonus. So if you're was, into was, cosplay and you want to like figure out a way to make make money with it, go to a genre-based improv school and learn. You're right. That's exactly yeah. how you do that. You want to be the, yeah. you know, you've always wanted to be, you know, Cinderella at Disney World, but they said no to you last time. Take one class. You'll go back. They'll be yeah. like, oh, my God, it's like she's in front of me. Like, it's, yeah, yeah those, it was, they really just it get it. You know what I mean? And I can't yeah. believe they get into those those genres so quickly like don't get me wrong i know there's a lot of work on a lot of shows i've watched yeah. them come out of rehearsal and it's like whoa they look tired but at the yeah. same time well, like wow yeah and that's what was so fascinating with like this uh improv group uh from hawaii and then also casey uh, people from uh, watching those guys do it and i was like that's something that we in vancouver don't do a lot of like obviously it's theater sports based so um, you know, like whose line is anyway type style, but not really that style, but those, the, the handles of that. Mm-hmm. And it was like, yeah, you know, you could do those, you could do scene through ways uh, so many times. It'll still be fun if you make it fun. But uh, having, finding new new ways of doing improv and watching improv and whatnot, um, it, it's hard to really cultivate that here in, North, in Vancouver because our audience is so used to watching the whose line is anyway with the Colin Mockries and whatnot. So introducing them to a long form, for example, like a 20 minute long form to a 25 minute long form, mm-hmm. uh, they'll get it, but not this. No, I don't want to say that we're we, our audience are dumb, but we have to downplay it. So they understand what's going on in a sense of like playing, doing a Herald or oh, I mean, it's doing a hard tap out. to get the audience yeah. into improv when you're doing a montage or something like that. And it's like a bunch sure. of disconnected scenes. Like, what are they involved in at all, right? So exactly. they, they have a exactly. hard time connecting. Whenever I teach level yeah. one improv, and it's mostly just montage improv that I'm teaching at that point, it's like yeah. you, when you do your improv, when you do your recital at the end of this level one class, like the people who are having the fun are you. Not that we're yeah. not enjoying and deeply supportive of you, but you're yeah. the one who's having fun. You can't possibly yeah. learn how to do it and make people like it in one level. Like, <laughs> sorry, you have to know how to do it first, and then, and then you can work on making people like it. You know, you oh, have to get real sure, good sure. at it before you can get the audience in on it, and then they're like, "I yeah. see what's happening." Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and that's funny. Like, I mean, during this whole time, you know, you talk about you were watching uh, something on the uh, Tiger King. You were talking about Tiger King, and <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and and then prior to that, like, I mean, prior to the lockdown, I heard nothing about this show called Middle Middle Ditch and, uh, and Schwartz. Oh yeah, Middle Ditch and Schwartz. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, okay, they're in, I don't know much about these guys. I'll watch it, and then I start reading a little bit more information. Like, oh, they're an improv mm-hmm. duo. Okay, let's mm-hmm. see how, see how they could pull this off. Because who's lying? I'm surprised they somehow really pull it off doing improv as a TV platform. It's, you know, without looking like it's fabricated and whatnot. So for them to do it, for these two to do it, I was like, wow, you guys are killing it. Like I was just so amazed what Middle Ditch and Schwartz did. I was like, that's so inspiring. And they only have three episodes, but if you guys have a chance to watch it, my gosh, they're such a fun duo. Like I loved they, that they did they, three episodes. You know what I mean? I thought they were just going to yeah. do one, you know, like a stand up yeah. set. But instead, they were like, no, here's three different shows. And I knew that they were doing it because they actually toured the country and came to Austin oh, yeah. a couple of times. So, like, they worked on oh, okay. doing this live show for a long time. And I think, yeah. I think they were doing the live show just to do the live show at first in major yeah. improv cities around. Um, around the country but then they were like hey let's uh, maybe Netflix or somebody came to them and was like hey let's film this I believe if I understand correctly because I listened to interviews with them on other podcasts like this they were like really 
really? You want to film it? Uh, it's not great filmed. <laughs> and they were like, no, no, we want to make a comedy special. And they're like, again, you know we're doing improv, right? Like, this is different. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of – and there's a lot of things you could take away from there as, you know, as a performer or even a student. Uh, not – what they what how their character or transitions whatever it's actually one one thing i find very fascinating that not a lot of improvisers could do properly is interview an audience and get suggestions from their life and just walk them through it not be smirching them whatever and having it was like oh so okay you're from this place oh interesting okay can you tell us a little bit of that not a lot of improvisers have a, a proper skill in doing that i find it's such a i find it's like a unique thing it's like hosting a show it's its own beast it's its own entity mm. compared to actually performing in a show and so watching uh both of them just talk to an audience member about how uh what they want for as an inspiration for their scenes uh i find that very fascinating how they actually interview an audience member because it was with with such care with such um with such honesty of how they really feel about the the suggestions or what they're getting and you know when they hear something like um oh this person was my the best man i didn't know i was the best man like whoa okay hold up let's back <laughs> up a little bit and they <laughs> took their time with it there was no rush to it um maybe for a tv reasons that they didn't have any they didn't have to rush it i think they were just killing airtime but it was just really fascinating watching how they just really set up their show like just yeah. so and it was also making sure that the entire audience knew what was going to happen because they were setting up the audience like what we do as improvisers setting up your partner to be successful they made that they made their audience look so successful and and loved by that crowd it was it was it was quite fascinating like i mean and then overall the show itself was just fantastic to watch but i thought that was the one thing that really gravitated to is like no one even including myself i have a tough time talking to an audience member about a day in their life because it's mm -hmm. you don't want to get too personal but you also you don't want to be too cheeky about it but you also want to be you want to honor what they're giving you and not look down at them if it's like something you didn't like it was yeah. kind of fascinating. Man, that's so great. I love that, you know, there's more improv and sketch comedy available for us to be watching just at home while we're on quarantine. And mm -hmm. uh, with the breadth of, you know, using Zoom across the world, you can be involved in, you know, like improv uh, jams or watching shows all across the country. Uh, not even the country, mm -hmm. the world. You can watch improv all across the world. And I think it's a great thing that you're so smart to to mention it's not don't just watch this show to be like oh aren't they cute aren't they fun they're ha 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 it's like what could you learn from them and i love that you pulled that detail out of it and that's why i'm gonna yeah. say that despite the fact that you've used the phrase retirement i don't believe DJ, <laughs> that this is the last show that you're ever gonna do you have been a self-starter from the beginning creating shows helping other people create shows putting things out out there trying to find ways to get yourself and other people on stage you are meant to do that kind of thing and you know what now you have time you're not involved with uh the uh, theater sports as much anymore so now you and your friends you're gonna go to the philippines i can feel it you're gonna make it happen <laughs> it's gonna be great and you're gonna do really serious dramatic improv and it's gonna be so awesome you're just like the yeah. energy of what you have put out and not only just telling me the story, but like the energy of helping the other people and doing and working on, you know, different communities and helping them embrace the, you know, theater that they love and get to play with improv. That's part of who yeah. you are. And you're just going to keep doing more stuff like that right now. You and me, we got to hang out with some toddlers for a little bit. But pretty soon, <laughs> we're back out making shows, yeah. making everybody laugh or cry. Whatever we want to do, it's going to be no. great. <laughs> well, to me, like, and uh, you know, I always looked at it like, um, for me, and this is just my own personal belief, like, whenever I'm doing a show, not to sound mean or whatever to my colleagues, I've done shows before, but I know I, I rarely perform for my colleagues. Uh, or entertain them as much as that's an added bonus. It's always the crowd, and if the crowd's loving everything you're doing and you're you're giving them an opinion about you, 
that's what it's worth. And I, I am an actor. Yes, I'm an actor. I love the limelight, but it's always been about the crowd. And as great as it is to learn from my fellow colleagues, which I do always, um, I always still have, I, I think it's because my upbringing of theater from my, high, my drama teacher is to respect the stage. And I think that's what I try to do is respect that stage and respect the audience for watching me on that stage. Totally. So. So great. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for sharing your stories. It has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much, Amy. And thank you for uh, the opportunity to tell you that I'm retiring. Or am I? (laughs) Thanks for listening to Yes But Why podcast. Check out all our episodes on YesButWhyPodcast.com or check out all the content on our network, HC Universal, at HCUniversalNetwork.com. <laughs>